Okay, welcome back. We've uh, got a session here with Glenn uh, from SnapRoute. Uh, as you all know, F uh, Flex Switch and from SnapRoute was uh, uh, accepted as one of the software contributions in OCP networking. Um, and so that is uh, part of that as, we, as if you may have, uh, if you were here earlier, we've got the whole, the whole set of, uh, of software being built out. And so Glenn's gonna share us, with us some of the, the customer experiences. Please help me welcome Glenn. Hello, hello. I'm having a great summit. So great, I've lost my voice from talking to too many people. So we're gonna get through this, uh, but uh, welcome. So I'm gonna get back to basics here. Uh, I, there's a lot of developers in the room. There's a lot of people with development backgrounds in the room. So this may or may not be for you, uh, but I, I get asked a lot of questions uh, from network engineers, from users, from operators, from folks who are trying to deploy some of this stuff uh, in an open way, in an API-driven way, and they say, how do I even use this? Why do I even need to use this? What is this all about? So the first question I'd like to answer is, why, why should a network engineer even care about APIs? Why, why would they care? And it's actually pretty simple, right? Anybody with some operational experience on you know, larger networks can tell you that you know, screen scraping is a pain, right? Logging into the CLI, running commands, pulling out the information you don't need, looking for that exact value that you want, storing it, doing something with it, it can be very painful. Also, most outages, in my experience, are caused by human error. Wrong file was pushed, wrong ACL was pushed, wrong uh, command was run, cut and paste failed, run on the wrong box, so on and so on and so forth, right? So the idea here is that if you learn from a DevOps model, so if you look at how other you know, server folks, storage folks, um, people that are not you know, in the classic CLI-based networking schemas have dealt with you know, finding data, storing data, troubleshooting, um, you know, and, and just operational pains, you'll see that you should adopt a DevOps model that uses APIs. So real, 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 real quick, what's an API mean to me or mean to you or mean to anybody? What are we talking about here? It's really quite simple. It's an interface that's data-driven, right? I ask for something, I get something back. I don't get everything in the world and then I have to look through it. I ask for something, I get something back. It's not, it's not human readable, it's not meant to be something that I you know, run and I look at and I put in a graph you know, just by looking at it on the device. It's, it's meant as a, as a programmatic model of getting information. So in FlexSwitch, we've adopted a RESTful model, right? So this is all very, very common for, for the developers in the room, but what, is, what does REST mean to us and why do we use it? It's lightweight, it's extremely lightweight. It's not SOAP, it's not Java, it's, it, it, it is just get post, patch, delete. It's very, very simple. It's HTTP based. You can, you can view it in a web browser using the URL requests. And, it's, and importantly, it's stateless, right? So I don't have to have information about the client on the server and vice versa. I'm just making calls. What's this VLAN? This VLAN's this. What's this IP? This IP is this. It's very, very simple. And that's what you'll see here. So real quick, the difference between the types, right? So in an API, and you'll see the documentation in a second, there's get, post, patch, and delete. So what do these mean? Real fast, get just means getting information, you know, getting actual objects, right? Post is creating something new. Uh, patch is updating something that already exists, and delete's getting rid of it, it's removing it. Very, very simple concepts. So, the immediate question is then is what APIs are available on whatever machine you're working on, whatever device, whatever application. In this case, it's FlexSwitch, right? So we, uh, for the FlexSwitch project, have adopted Swagger UI. Um, I could start a religious discussion in this room about whether you should use Swagger or one of the other you know, API documentation systems out there, but uh, we like Swagger because it's pretty easy. Uh, it, it's pretty and it's, it's, it actually can execute the, the APIs, the curls on in the application itself. So in the web UI, you can go through and fill out forms and actually try the, the commands and get the results and you don't have to necessarily you know, leave Swagger to really understand what the APIs do and how to use them. So you can see for this particular type, this is the IPv4 interface. 
uh, you can see that it shows you everything you can do and you just click through these, right? Delete, get, patch, post, and it shows you how to do it for just an individual or for a particular object or for a bulk. So if you want to look at one of these APIs as an example, what, is it, what does it actually look like, right? So if we go to this IPv4 interface, it actually shows you, right? There's a parameter, the value, you can enter these in. Those, those are typed in, the VLAN 100, the 10.1.10.1 slash 24. Those are, those are entries that are actually uh, put in the system. The up value is a default. You can actually change that to down, obviously. It gives you a description, tells you what it's expecting, strings, forms, whatever, right? Um, there's the URL on the bottom for reference. And, and here's kind of the next part of the page where it actually lets you execute. It'll tell you what the curl is. It'll actually output the exact thing you need to run that command, to run that uh, configuration that you've entered in. Also a request URL in case you want to take a look at it later. And it, and it actually runs it. So this is, a, this is showing you the response, and you can see it's 201. 201 is a HTTP create, right? So it actually went, created that interface uh, IP object, and then associated it with that object ID, and it tells you right there result success. If it failed, it would tell you a result and why it failed. Uh, you know, if it was something it was expecting a string and you gave it a number, vice versa, sort of thing, right? So you can get the headers as well to get the information based on when you ran it. So. Let's look at the curl real quick, because the whole point is, is I want to show how easy this is, right? So this is, this is it. It looks a little long, but if you break it down, it's just, it's a little bit bulky from a, from a content and a, you know, the header type and the, and the response that it wants to accept, right? Those are just saying, I want JSON, and I'm going to give you JSON. And then I'm just supplying three values. I'm supplying the interface as a reference, VLAN 100, the IP address, you know, 10, 1, 10, 1, 24, and then the admin states up. That's it, and then the URL is telling you where it is. It's a config, it's a config API for that interface type, and it, and it just has a path. Uh, you, of course, local host would be your IP, right? So real quick, I showed you some gets, uh, bulk get versus get, right? So it's the difference between objects and uh, a group of objects, and we'll talk about the object IDs in just a minute, but if you look at, if you look at this get, it's actually for a specific object ID. So you can see that that object ID is tied to VLAN 100. I can query for that if I want to store those object IDs somewhere locally as I'm programming whatever my interface that I want to program. If you're writing a CLI, if you're writing some other you know, GUI, something that you want to actually do things with these objects, you can store these object IDs for later, off box or on box if you so choose. And the difference here is this is everything. So it's, it's really quite simple, just add an S at the end, right? So now it's IPv4 interface, which is not human readable or sayable, but it's up there with an S. And now you'll see it's VLAN 100, VLAN 200. Uh, it shows you all three of the things that we configured before, the interface type, the, the state, and of course the IP address. So just one little thing on object IDs here. Why are they so important? It's because it gives us a unique way of identifying the different objects in the system. Every single object, an IP address, a port, a uh, route, a BGP neighbor, a insert name of anything you'd have on a device, right? It has an object ID and that object ID is unique and it's programmatically generated so that you can reference that throughout the course, the runtime course of the device. It changes on, on config, right? So it's, it's generated when you configure it, when you create the object, it, it binds it to an object ID. So you can use that programmatically if you were, you know, grab all the interfaces and step through them and pull in more information out. It allows you to uh, scale, write things for scaling so that you're not always dumping everything at the same time. So you're not saying, what's all the interfaces? Show me all the interfaces all the time. Uh, and then, f f Real quick, just showing the difference between config and state. So uh, in, in, in FlexSwitch, we keep track of two different, there's actually events as well, but I, I won't get into them here. But in the, in, the, in the realm of configuration, there's two different uh, sets of parameters you could have for any object, right? So on the left is the config. It's what I've showed you several times now. It's just what we've configured. And on the right, kind of stored sep completely separately in the database is a state. 
So that gives you all the information about it. Is it operationally up? You'll see if you can read that, the VLAN 200 is not operationally up. It's, it's down, it didn't have any interfaces associated with it, so it's down, we have an auto admin state up, but that's a, different, that's a different story, right? So you can see all the information about that VLAN as it's running, um, which is of course different than config. This allows you to be able to make changes and then val validate state based on what you did. So I make a config change, I check the config side, uh, I see what it does to the state side. And because they're separate, they're, you can treat them separate in a sort of cause and effect sort of way when you're doing your, your programmatic configurations. Um, and then finally, uh, where do you get started, right? I, I think the best uh, place to get started was with the Docker configuration. Um, we have a Docker version up on Docker Hub. It has all of this in it. Um, this was actually generated from it. Uh, it, it has the, the Swagger APIs, it has, the, it has all of the configuration abilities uh, of FlexSwitch just running in Docker, uh, so it creates virtual interfaces and things like that. You can set up ping, you can set up BGP, you can set up OSPF, uh, and just use the APIs and, and see how to configure it before putting it on a real device in production. And that's it. Any questions? Oh, where'd Omar go? There he is. <laughs> I assume you have to authenticate to the to the flag switch before you can run the REST API. Right? So there's there's authentication is available via an Nginx uh, front end. So what you would do is you would put uh, Nginx on that we have some setup scripts to do that. You put an Nginx on there and you run it, you know, as a as a proxy, right? So that you would do a uh, secure connection to that, and then it would open up the connection to the FlexSwitch APIs directly. So that's how you authenticate. We also, through some other means, we have TACAX if you're going directly onto the device or LDAP um, if you're running calls local but the main method is through Nginx. Or you could, use, you could use Apache as well if you wanted to, but most folks choose not to who are doing off with this. Does that make sense? <laughs> Any other questions? Ah, good question. Can you repeat, um, can you repeat the question? Yeah, can so he's, he asked, how do you control versioning uh, of the APIs? So. The, each, each daemon is separated, each protocol is separated by a daemon. So BGP, OSPF, LDP, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there is software versions that you can pull up. Um, it'll dump like a JSON table and say, your BGP is version you know, 0 0.1.3.4 and your API is 1.3. And then there's a compatibility information about um, where the API and the version of the, B, of the actual daemon you know, shift. So it's like uh, APIs 1.2 is compatible with versions BGP X through Y. So it is stored um, and it's available by a query um, and you can, it is locked together. We haven't had too much of that because it's a data migration question from one version of the API yeah. to the other version of the API. Omar's good at this repeat the question thing. Um, yeah, so you would you would have to do that right now manually, um, but we don't actually move the data models much. So early on we moved a, mu a lot, but we don't move the. If, so if it's a BGP model, you, you we add stuff to it, but unless it changes what is actually required it won't change what the call is. So even if we add stuff, new features, as long as they're optional, the old, call, the old calls that don't have those will still work. So the only time it would change is if we like rename the API, which we did in the beginning a lot, and it was very frustrating, but now we've, we've pretty standardized on that. So there's a question in the back. The question was, do you handle uh, batch transaction processing or do you provide mutual exclusion support so that if you have multiple people touching your switch, 
you don't have to worry about race conditions from right right so it, it it does lock it it does lock it with a token as far as i understand you've now entered into the realm where i'm not a developer i'm a network engineer so if you want more details i can put you into contact with somebody who architected it but i know for a fact if two people there is a situation where the config gets locked if two people try to configure at the same time it'll actually not allow it it won't allow two people to modify the same object at the same time but i don't know the mechanism that does it but that's a great question so to that end, do you find other network engineers kind of trying out this API and using this? Yeah, you know, yeah. So the, 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 what I try to do is I, I show them via, you know, we have a, a Python API, a Python CLI that runs on top of these APIs. Uh, and it works great for kind of getting to understand it. But it actually, at the bottom, uh, when you run a command, it dumps out both the Python SDK and it dumps out what the actual API was. So what I've done is show people, like, this is how to do the configuration, and then they say, oh, this is how I would do it programmatically, and then they start learning Python or start learning some other you know, tools like Ansible, and they start integrating together these things. So I do find there's interest, um, even if there is a gap. Do the network engineers ask for a CLI, too? All the time. Just ask. Just we ask. have not gotten away from that. Okay. We thought we did, and then we found there's knocks and there's there's crews that want to troubleshoot with CLIs, and you know what? I'm guilty too. I still use it. I used it at Delta on, on what was that Tuesday night? I used the CLI at Delta. Sorry. <laughs> you know, no, no apologies. You use it for some things, but then you use the, the programmatic APIs for. It, you, know, you know, some things you it's just easier, and some things it's not. So. Other questions. Other questions. All right. Thank oh, you. Oh, 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 nope, oh, sorry, oh, almost, oh. almost, but here we go. Sneaking one, one into the bottom. One more. How well is these APIs received? With, uh, do you have any suggestions externally that came in as an input to you? Appstra, have you guys heard of Appstra? Yeah, they love them. In fact, when, they, when I tell you that names don't change much, it was true until Jeremy Shulman spent too much time with my, with my stuff, and then all the APIs names started to change because him and I talked and we're like, yeah, you're right. It, this, this doesn't make any sense, this doesn't make any sense. Um, but so far, we've, we've had pretty good reception from the, from the models. They seem to make sense. Um, they're not overly complicated, and people are consuming them fairly well. So, so far, it's pretty positive, but cool. All right. Thank Help you. Thank Glenn. Thank you. Thank you.